Good afternoon. I'm John Lindahl. I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series held here at the Nebraska History Museum the third Thursday of every month. A detailed schedule for this series, as well as information about all the Historical Society's programs and the services, can be found on our website, which is nebraskahistory.org. Before I introduce today's speakers, I want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for funding the filming of these lectures. Their financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television. Our speakers today are <coughs> Shirley Schaffen and Sheila Green. Shirley Schaffen is a charter member of the Nebraska State Quilt Guild and the Nebraska Quilters Guild, of which she is a former vice president. She is the Discover Nebraska volunteer in the fourth grade classrooms. She's been quilting for 34 years and created the 2002 Nebraska State Quilt Guild Raffle Quilt. Our other participant today is Sheila Green. Sheila is past president of the Lincoln Quilters Guild, education chair for the Nebraska State Quilt Guild, and presenter for Discover Nebraska in the fourth grade classrooms. She is a docent at the International Quilt Study Center and Museum, and Sheila has been quilting since 1998. Shirley and Sheila's topic today is memory quilts. Please welcome Shirley Chaffin and Sheila Green. What is a memory quilt? I believe that all quilts are memory quilts. Webster tells me that memory is about remembrance of the past, to memorialize or to commemorate. Throughout history, quilters have been recording their personal stories in quilts. This photo is from an exhibition of photographs called Recovered Views, African American Portraits, 1912 to 1925, a collection of black and white images made by an African American photographer who lived and worked in Lincoln in the early 20th century. The images document life in a vibrant black community, a society rarely depicted in any medium. The photographs are attributed to John Johnson, son of a black Civil War veteran and a lifelong resident of Lincoln. Art McWilliams, a Lincoln resident, has graciously granted his permission for us to use this photograph. The collection has toured the United States. Quilts are like a diary or journal. They tell us about the maker. What colors did she like? Was she hurried or did she do her best work? Was it made for a special occasion or everyday use? Hidden clues will help you learn about a quilt. The popularity of signature quilts began in 1830 and peaked in the mid-1800s in the United States. This was a time when many pioneers were leaving family and friends on the East Coast and immigrating westward. In addition to quilts, autograph albums and scrapbooks were popular. Signature quilts featured names, dates, and places inscribed in ink or embroidery. The advent of permanent ink that wouldn't run on cloth and the invention of the steel pinpoint in 1803 contributed to the friendship quilt's popularity. This chintz applique quilt was made in Trenton, New Jersey in 1845. The individual chintz motifs frame a panel on which an eagle purchase, perches with outstretched wings. A note accompanying the quilt stated that it was made by Maria Fish to commemorate Jonathan and Emmeline's wedding anniversary. The names of the recipients of the quilt, Jonathan and Emmeline, Fish were inscribed directly below each wing. The blocks were signed by a host of friends, neighbors, and family members. According to Carolyn Ducey, International Quilt Study Center and Museum, who studied the chintz applique quilts for her doctoral research, these women were following a trend in creating album quilts and participating in the Daughters of the American Revolution, an appropriate activity for young women in their social circle in the 1840s. The album style in chintz applique was likely due to the increased popularity of these album quilts, or 
paper autograph albums from the 1830s and 40s. The quilt is in the collection of the International Quilt Studies Center and Museum. This image is shown with their permission. It was also shown in the Chintz Applique exhibition. Friendship quilts or album quilts, frequently given away when one moved, were often made from leftover scraps of fabric from each individual. The saying, cut from the same cloth, originated then. <coughs> Family members might include fabrics from deceased and living relatives in their quilts, a sort of genealogical record. Seeing and touching the fabric reminds us of special times or even ordinary days when family members dressed in these clothes. Quilts give comfort and evoke <coughs> emotional and personal feelings, our memories. Roger and Mary Gormley have donated 300 doll quilts and over 60 doll beds to the International Quilt Studies Center and Museum. Currently, the exhibition Childhood Treasures, Doll Quilts from the Gormley Collection can be seen at the museum. Mary shared this crib quilt from 1863. It's a nine patch with four patches, 42 inches by 30 inches. Mary says, when purchased, the top batting and lining were all basted together but not quilted. I bought it in 1983 in Centerville, Indiana, and I quilted it in 1984. There was a card pinned to the quilt saying, This baby quilt was made at a time Mama was born, January 15, 1863, by her mother. Mary asks, Who's Mama? 1863 was wartime. Did she die? The teaching thing is that someone cared and labeled the quilt. These are the fabrics of 1863 or before. The Reconciliation Quilt. The album quilt is owned by the International Quilt Studies Center and Museum. The images is shown with their permission. The quilt was a gift from Robert and artist James. It was made in 1867 by Lucinda Ward Honstead of New York and chronicles the maker's memories through her life. During her early life, her family owned slaves. The quilt depicted the now free African Americans in several different occupations. It's called the Reconciliation Quilt because a block that depicts the release and the reunion of Confederate President Jefferson Davis from prison and his daughter Margaret. Lucinda's daughter Emma is portrayed on the quilt as are many other family members her home, and her school. The quilt explores personal, social, and cultural identity of Lucinda's life in the years following the Civil War. Hortense Beck is a quilter from Topeka, <coughs> Kansas, and she began, began quilting at the age of 60. She made and donated many replicas of the famous American quilts, including the Reconciliation Quilt, to the International Quilt Studies Center and Museum. Permission was granted to show this image. A line of fabric has been designed from the fabric and images in Lucinda's quilt. This is the doll quilt. Yeah, this is the doll quilt. Very jumpy. There, there you go. Yes. Uh, that was made from the fabrics in 2009. High Style Crazy Quilts came into vogue in 1880. The typical crazy quilt is made from random shapes and various pieces of fabric sewn together on a fabric foundation. Any type of fabric can be used in making of a crazy quilt. The fancy crazy quilts were made with fabrics such as silk, satin, and velvet, left over from clothing made for the family or purchased for the purpose of making the quilt. Most crazy quilts are embellished further by adding decorative embroidery stitches, lace, ribbons, embroidered initials and names, or even seashells. These crazy quilts were used for decorations, but not a bed cover. Thrifty housewives use leftover bits of fabric like wool or cotton are used clothing and little or no embellishment to create more serviceable quilts used as bed coverings. Crazy quilts are not only beautiful, but they tell us much about the makers. 
this is Gertie's crazy quilt, and it was made in 1887. It was donated to the Discover Nebraska presentations. How pleased <coughs> Gertie would be today, 123 years later, that her quilt has been seen over by over 16,000 children, plus many adults in the elementary schools. Gertie's quilt is full of memories, including names like uh, Tom, Grandma, Jay, Baby, and the City of Omaha. The Crazy Quilt features hand-painted patches, cigarette silks, and lovely embroidery, some done with a chenille thread. The silk and other fragile fabric the silk and other fragile fabrics are shattering. We conserve this quilt by covering it with a black illusion tool. Gertie's quilt is making memories with fourth graders in Lincoln and the surrounding communities. After the Civil War, women became involved in social movement for benefit of the less fortunate. Quilts were used as fundraisers for creating quilts featuring autographs, then auctioned off to raise funds. Later, they would sell spaces on the quilt, change, charging by the name and the location of on the quilt. They were first and often referred to as dime quilts, as they were, it was 10 cents charge per name. Often a single quilt raised funds by both selling signatures and then a quilt raffle. Money raised by churches was used for building projects or mission outreach. American quilt makers supported national issues at the onset of World War I. The American Red Cross faced monumental expenses for medical supplies, blankets, and ambulances. Mm -hmm. The Red Cross published instructions for making a signature foundation quilt uh, in Modern Priscilla Magazine in December of 1917. There are suggestions as to the number of signatures, placement, and subscription charges. A quilt could raise as much as $1,000 for the Red Cross. The article stated that $1,000 would buy an ambulance or bedding for 129 beds. A sample ticket form for selling signatures was included. <coughs> it's even suggested that names could fill the back as well as the front side of the quilt. The Red Cross fundraising quilt, permission to use this, uh, was granted by the Nebraska State Historical Society. The Red Cross quilt was made in 1916 by the women of Martell, Nebraska, to raise money for the Red Cross. Fifty cents was charged for each of the 682 residents of Martell whose names were then written on the quilt. The quilt also includes its signatures of President Woodrow Wilson, Secretary of War Baker, General Pershing, and Theodore Roosevelt. The quilt was purchased at auction for $75 by Dick Vonderhoek, the father of one of the quilt makers. Dick was a rural mail carrier at that time, and $75 was a month's wages. $411 was raised for the Red Cross. Quilts also carry the memories of time spent together in quilt making. Women of the family who were family, women of the family and their friends often gathered together at quilting bees to stitch together the top, batting, and backing of the quilt. These were not only times when a lot of work was done, but also times when women and girls bonded with each other through conversation and togetherness, sharing many joys and concerns, bonding together as they added stitches to the quilt. Many groups charged for the quilting by the number of spools of thread used. It was an all-day affair. They took their lunches, enjoyed each other's company, and solved some of the world's problems. Jean Davies' quilt that is most special to her is this blue and white Irish chain quilt made by her grandmother in the late 1920s. Two matching twin quilts were made, one for Jean and the other for her sister, Dorothy Young. Jean recalls reading under the covers with a bed lamp and seeing the designs made by the quilt blocks with the light. This applique friendship quilt was made by Ethel Manser. 
Ethel used and cherished this quilt every day. It was made in York County in the early 1930s and features embroidered signatures of Ethel's family and friends. Ernest Haight of David City was one of Lincoln Quilters Guild charter members in 1973-1974. Ernest and his wife Isabel were married in 1928 and were parents of five children. Thanks to his daughter, Maybell Haight of Lincoln, for sharing the quilt made by her dad in 1936. That's a lovely quilt in back of us. And Maybell's in the audience. Thank you, Maybell. Kaleidosco Kaleidoscope Star is the second quilt made by Ernest, the first in a series of four quilts that were pieced by him and hand quilted by a 75-year-old father, Elmer Haight. Ernest graduated from uh, University of Nebraska at Lincoln in 1923 with a degree in agricultural engineering. He returned to the family homestead instead of following an engineering degree career. He pieced many of his quilts on the treadle sewing machine his maternal grandparents brought by covered wagon to Butler County about 1880. He purchased a zigzag model in 1960. Then he devised a method for quilting by machine. He explained his method in a booklet entitled Practical Machine Quilting for the Homemaker, published in 1974. Ernest carved wooden puzzles before he made quilts. Ernest's quilting career began in 1936 and continued 50 years until 1986. He won many, many prizes at the Butler County Fair and the Nebraska State Fair. He was inducted into the Nebraska State Quilt Guild Hall of Fame. He didn't keep track of the number of quilts he made. His wife, Isabel, estimated that he gave away 5 to 15 quilts each year. Ernest says he quilted to relieve tension and to stay out of trouble. Maybell reports that she owns 43 of her dad's quilts. Thanks, Maybell, for lending us this quilt. This quilt is also featured in the book, Nebraska Quilts and Quilt Makers. This is my ba bed jacket made for my grandmother Standridge's quilt that she made for me in 1947. <clears throat> my grandmother was always a piecer and a hand quilter. When she learned that she was going to lose her eyesight, she pieced many quilt tops and had them ready to finish when she was blind. I cherished my quilt and used it, always feeling her cuddle of love. Well, you guessed it, I wore it out. It really was in bad shape when I decided to make it special again. I chose the sound parts and of the bed jacket. I used new reproduction fabrics for the facings, pockets, etc. And now, when I don't feel the best, I just cuddle up with Grandma again, and I don't think she would have minded at all. Pat Hackley's nine patch quilt is primarily uh, by feed sack fabrics in the late 1940s. Her grandmother, Josephine Warren Combs, helped her make the quilt. Pat says she was a very special person to me. She suggested that we make a nine patch quilt when I was about 11 years old. We used fabrics from her stash and scrap basket. Some of them were feed sacks to make two quilts. They used a treadle sewing machine to piece and then to quilt. Virginia Welty's friendship sampler uh, is a special treasure to Jenny because it was made by 10 friends right after the Lincoln Quilters Guild's most successful symposium in 1977. It is registered at the Quilt History Project. The quilt was started in 1977, completed in 1983. Virginia stitched inside the label a paper that includes additional quilt documentation. The Bible quilt was made by Ruth Hicks and quilted by Ruth and her LQG friends. The story of this quilt goes back to 1980, when Virginia Welty and Mary Gormley saw a Bible quilt in Columbia, Missouri. They set out to make a raffle quilt for Westminster Presbyterian Church's 75th anniversary. Ruth drafted the patterns that were researched and selected. They decided to have a Bible study about the quilt box as they constructed as was, it was being 
constructed by the group. The quilt raised $1,020 for missions. This is Ruth's quilt, a copy of the original. All the blocks are documented with a Bible reference. Ruth gave programs about the quilt. This, uh, there, were seven there are seven typewritten pages of documentation. The Westminster Bible Quilt Project is detailed in the summer 1984 issue of Quilt World magazine in three-page article with several photos. Millie Corkle's quilt is, is made of embroidered uh, Kate Greenway drawings. Millie's husband was an exchange professor in Dublin, Ireland in the fall of 1986. Millie took the blocks along to embroidery. As she finished each block, she embroidered the names of the places where they had lived and visited, such as Dalkey and, and uh, Sorrento Cottage. The last blocks were finished in London where they ended their stay. Millie confesses that the quilt took her 23 years to finish. Sally Campbell tells the most memorable quilt, her most memorable quilt experience. Sally and Anne Godey are pictured with their quilt at Sheldon. Sally tells us, in 1988, the king and queen of Sweden were coming to the United States to commemorate the 350th anniversary of the first Swedish settlers in America. A collection, a celebration called New Sweden 88. Her daughter Amy was working for the New Sweden 88 committee and called to say that the Swedish Council of America members wanted to present a quilt to the royal couple, a remembrance from the 12 cities from which they would visit in the United States. Anne Godey pieced the selected pictures. The quilt blocks were mounted and sent to the 12 cities to be presented to the king and queen during their visit. The finished quilt was first shown at Sheldon Art Gallery, then at the Swedish Institute in Minneapolis. It was primarily and personally presented to the queen at the Palace, Palace in Stockholm in December of 1988, a fabulous experience for an American of Swedish descent. Sally and her daughter are shown with the Queen Sylvia and the beautiful quilt. Louise Howey was Lincoln Quilters Guild first president, 1973 to 1974. This two four patch quilt was made in 1997 to 1998. Louise donated the quilt to the quilt show auction in 2006. It was repurchased in 2006. It was purchased in 2006, redonated in 2008, and again donated and auctioned at the May 2010 quilt show. Shirley Chaffin's quilt is Sunshine Shirley and Rancher Jack. This happy quilt was made in 1996 and 97 for their 40th wedding anniversary. She had taken a Sunbonnet Sioux class at Quilt Nebraska and could see the possibilities of making this a memory quilt. Each block represents a month of the year during doing the timely things that ranchers and their lady rancherettes do. This one having been raised in Los Angeles, California. The borders of this quilt depict the four seasons of Mother Earth. Sandy Anderson says that her quilt, Family and Friends, is almost a double-decker quilt. She wanted the back of the top layer to be a gradation of color from bright morning to darker evening, beginning to end. The blocks on the left side are family, the right side are friends, also from beginning to end and passing through the seasons of the year. The tree is a common symbol in each block and grows bigger as the seasons pass. The leaves or branches are made of a Celtic knot, also changing with the seasons. The family starts with the marriage of two people, starting a new family, growing to add children, more growth as the children grow, bringing spouses and grandchildren into the family, and end up with the original couple still together. The friend side starts with young children making friends and growing up to start careers, 
to grow as they share family experiences and still friends, the blocks are off kilter a little as our lives do not always run smooth and straight. A sentiment is embroidered down the center and a yellow rose for remembrance is added. Several Lincoln Quilters Guild members have been involved with helping with Charlie Brown Kids in Camp Hugs, organizations that help children after the loss of a parent. The children were to bring an article of clothing for their deceased parent. One young lady brought her dad's flannel pajama bottoms, another a t-shirt, and so on. A counselor helped them fill out a questionnaire about their memories of their deceased parent. Morning Hope is a grief support network for children, teens, young adults, and their families who have experienced a death of someone special to them. The quilts are comprised of individual blocks created by children. Throughout the grieving sessions, participants are given blocks to draw pictures that reflect a favorite memory of their loved one. More than 40 quilts now tell a variety of stories. Recalling memories of loved ones through the art of quilting is a creative means for remembrance and healing and a sincere expression of hope for the future. Like the Red Cross quilt made earlier, this Relay for Life quilt owned by Jerry Fromm was made to raise funds for cancer research. Jerry wore the t-shirts used in the quilt while walking the survivor's lap. The quilt was made by Beverly Fromm. This is a St. Paul United Methodist Church's 150th anniversary quilt made in 2007. The design was from original watercolor drawn by church member Alan Ebner. Each design of this quilt represents something special at the church. You will notice the log cabin and the circuit rider approaching on horseback, the large stained glass windows, baptismal font, the universal Methodist symbol, and the beautiful passion flowers growing wildly at the cross. To your far right, notice the fire that burnt the church to the ground inside. There had been a fire next door, and the firemen didn't think the stone church would burn, but the timbers supporting the roof were set ablaze, and the entire interior was destroyed. Bonnie Cuchera's dad was a rancher. He was very proud of his Hereford cattle, so much that he would sell a calf if the marking were not to his liking. When his two sons came over, took over, they wanted to increase the herd, <coughs> So they bought some cows. They were only interested in good producing cows, not their looks, so the cattle herd became a motley crew. <coughs> the reason my brothers took over the ranch, Bonnie says, was because my dad was in the beginnings of dementia. But I look at it and know that he would just be shaking his head. How could he possibly have raised two sons that didn't care about the markings on cows? In the quilting are cow birds, cow bells, cow pies, cow lilies, and the quilt name, Holy Cow. Out of Control, in memory of Bill, is traveling throughout the U.S. as in Am Ami Sims' Alzheimer's Forgiving, Forgetting, Piece by Piece, exhibition of 52 quilts. This quilt is a tribute to Bill, a friend of Kate's family. Kate relates, Bill was this big, kind, godly, gentle man. Slowly, we noticed Bill seemed to be going. He seemed to be aging. He was forgetting things more and more. This in-charge man now needed help to do the easiest things. Kate Lockhammer explains her quilt design. The outside circle or path represents life to me. All of the colors together moving along. Important names and dates are embroidered on the path. But then the Alzheimer's, the black, creeps in. At first it's barely noticeable, but gradually it creeps in more and more. The person with Alzheimer's is on a different path. It coincides with the family for a while, but eventually it's a downward spiral and the Alzheimer's creeps in more and more. It's taking over until finally the days are filled with black and only a little of the color of life remains. At last, it's only black. The person you loved is no longer there. 
They are quilts of heartbreak and hope, hope for a cure for Alzheimer's disease. Ten years ago, the Alliance for American Quilts launched an oral history project designed to collect recorded interviews with the quilt makers. These interviews are available on their website. The project is called Quilters SOS, Save Our Stories. A thousand interviews have been conducted, capturing and preserving quilt makers' stories in their own words. Kate has recorded her story. You can also make a video recording of your own quilt story in the virtual gallery at the International Quilt Study Center here in, here in Lincoln. Quilt stories can be viewed on the website. Kate's quilt design inspired a garden planted at the Shelburne Art Museum. Jane Grabenstein's Chandler made this photo transfer quilt. The photos are of the four generations of her family, beginning with all of the great grandparents and includes geo Genealog <laughs> genealogical information. She quilted into the borders the surnames and preceding gen of preceding generations. The sashing is quilted with an unending <coughs> vine, symbolic of the connection between the generation. The Lincoln Quilters Guild has a partnership with Habitat for Humanity. They've had it since 2006. New LQG members are invited to a workshop to make house blocks for Habitat for Humanity wall hangings to be given to the new Habitat homeowners and for fundraising. $6,145 was raised for Habitat for Humanity with a queen size quilt and two wall hangings to be used for their 100th home for a family here in Lincoln. Quilts can create memories. <coughs> Lincoln Quilters Guild Discover Nebraska Quilt was made in 2001 by nine Lincoln Quilter Guild members. Discover Nebraska is our community outreach project <coughs> that combines the history of quilting and the history of the state of Nebraska for eager to learn fourth graders. The quilt was created, has created memories for about 16,000 <laughs> fourth graders since 2001. Uh, I made the, was asked to make the Nebraska State Raffle Quilt in 2001. The, re quilt, the result was a quilt entitled, United We Stand. The hardest part of piecing and quilting this quilt was keeping it a secret for a year that I worked on it. Of course, this is my keepsake piece. The original was a queen size quilt. As we all recall, September 2001 was a turning point in American history. September 11th will be remembered always as a dark part of our American history, thus the symbolic red, white, and blue. This is Sheila Green's quilt, proud to be an American. Patriotic, religious, and civilian pins and buttons embellish the Bargello flag wall hanging. These symbols are free of freedom and hope, are memorabilia from which uh, her family members, some who had served and protected our country in the early 1900s to the present. Remembering and honoring the past makes her proud to be an American. This is a great way to get those things out of jewelry boxes and storage and to be seen by family and friends. Each one tells a story. The quilted teapot was made by Sheila Green for Joanne Bear's birthday. The women and their husbands traveled to Tanzania, Tanzania Africa in 2008. The fabrics and banana beads on the handle were pur purchased from the street markets in Tanzania. The owner collects teapots and bananas. As a child, Linda Gap was fascinated by the missionaries in Africa. This is her Tanzania memory quilt. Linda says, I, dream of, I dreamed of going to Africa and doing mission work. The quilt is made from an assortment of African fabrics purchased at the village market. The color is primarily green, and this reminds me of the beautiful vegetation that you see when you ascend the slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro. Sheila Green's Eiffel Tower is a quilt inspired by her trips to Paris. 
Fabric used were pa pa painted, sun printed on her driveway, and commercial boutiques. Travel creates memories of time spent with family and friends. Mary Court's Crazy Quilt was made in 1991. In this sweet little crazy quilt, you'll find part of a necktie worn by her husband, a high-level math teacher in Broken Bow. In those days, it was a tie-in suit every day for teachers. You will also find a tie that was worn on her son's confirmation, a long piece of hand-embroidered lace from her grandmother's nightie. There are many other memories in this quilt, but the one that I'd like to point out is the small handprint in the corner her only granddaughter at age four, who married this past July. Bonnie Kuchera says she wanted to show you her dad's handkerchief. Bonnie says, after my dad died, I've looked and looked for a piece of fabric that said, this is my dad, but I never found it. Now, two years later, as I was cleaning out boxes, I came upon an almost new handkerchief that my mom would have given to me. <coughs> The way I learned to iron was doing dad's handkerchiefs, so it meant something to me. The cone flowers remind me of the big-headed clover out in the meadow at his ranch. When my dad was waiting for it to be time for haying, he would park by the road and walk out among the prairie grass and clover. I now have a quilted memory of my dad. This king-size quilt was made in memory of Rippy by Mary Cordy. All of her married life, she and her husband had dachshund or wiener dogs. So after Mary lost her beloved husband and then her dog, she decided to make a quilt in memory of the family pets. This quilt is huge and has amazing realism to their beloved dog, Rippy. Mary's been asked many times over the years, how many pieces of fabric, how many different shades of brown. She always laughs and says, I just don't know. Wonderful memories. Marilyn Rembolt created Hunter's first taste when her first grandchild celebrated his first birthday. Marilyn says, it was my joy to follow family tradition and let grandma serve the grandchild's very first taste of ice cream with an ice cream cone. He loved it, and so did I. I immortalized this moment into fabric from a photograph of the event, and in 2009 took a class with Peg Pinnell at Quilt Nebraska. Fabrics are applied, free motion quilted with threads, as was the thread lettering for the border. The quote, without ice cream there would be darkness and chaos, is credited to Dan Cardorg. The background fabric was hand dyed by Marilyn. This quilt is made by three generations, grandmother Sandy Anderson, daughter Nikki Krause, and, their gra and Sandy's granddaughter Emma Krause, who was age nine when the quilt was made. The quilt's enti entitled, My Favorite Things. Emma's now 10, and she tells us that her dad has just completed cancer treatments, so this quilt is really important to their family. The quilt details the family members, parents, Shane and Nick, Nikki, and their children, Emma and Daniel, and activities they like to do together. This is a work in progress, as there are still names and dates to be added. The family's dogs... Brandy and Jinx are featured on the quilt. Emma added books because her mom, Nikki, loves to read. The family enjoys going to car shows and then getting ice cream afterwards. Paper quilts are another way to capture a memory. We shared this technique in the Family Memory Workshop here at the Nebraska History Museum. Created with vacation photos and maps of the destination, these two children, actually, Jordan and uh, Justin Canoost, have made memory quilts. The photos and maps are cut to size, glue sticked onto paper, and put into acrylic frames. The frames have magnets so can be put on the refrigerator. This is a great activity to do with a child. This memory quilt program originated in the fall of 2008 when I was asked to lead a memory quilt workshop for elementary age students during their fall break. This was in conjunction with the museum's memories exhibit. Family crayon memory quilts were created. 
See how proud the girls are of their quilts? I've enjoyed researching the history of memory quilts, compiling the information, locating great examples, and sharing the memories with many audiences. Sarah's quilt was made by Jackie Turner Greenfield in 2002. Jackie made the quilt in memory of her daughter, Sarah Corrine Turner, born in Lincoln, Nebraska in 1969. Sarah died of smoke inhalation at age three and a half as a result of a house fire. The inspiration for Sarah's quilt is a tile quilt circa 1886 made for Hattie Burdick by family members. The Burdick quilt is in the collection of the International Quilt Study Center and Museum. Sarah, a fabric for the angel's gown is from one of Sarah's nightgown. The ladybug fabric on, is from Sarah's playpen pad. So Jackie saved and used fabric from clothing that she had made or purchased for Sarah. The label on the back of the quilt has photos of Sarah in a fabric pocket with notes about Sarah and documentation of the individual blocks in the quilt. Sarah's quilt appears in two books, Making Memories and Tile Quilt Revival, Reinventing a Forgotten Form. I've recently learned that there are only 23 documented historical tile quilts in existence. Sadly, the Nebraska State Fair held in Lincoln is only a memory. This is a photo from a, an exhibit that says it all with photos from past state fairs. Quilts preserve memories and tell stories. A quilt means more than just a warm blanket. While quilts are no longer necessary to provide warmth or to cover a bed, they continue to provide a warm reminder of the friendships and memories that enrich our lives. Sometimes it's like putting together a scrapbook of memories. Many of these quilts were made and given to remember those leaving or those left behind. Perhaps they were used to raise funds or awareness for social causes. The memories that are stitched into quilts can be the bond that ties families together. Share your quilt stories with memories with members of your family. When this you see, Remember Me is a traditional autograph book inscription. We want to remember and to be remembered. It's as simple as that. Family and friends, special moments and important events, those meaningful things in our lives are the memories that we treasure. At this time, we invite your questions. Yes? I know it's important to put a label on the quilt so you know who made it and things, but are there other things you should put on the label? Okay, the question is about a quilt label and what information should be included on the quilt label. Shirley? Um, I think that if we go with the information that reporters do, who, what, when, and where is important. It was earlier pointed out to me that often a, a woman should add her, um, her maiden name because if researchers later are hunting, it will uh, simplify things if uh, Shirley Owen Chaffin is on that quilt label. I've never done this, but I will start. I think it's important. Uh, I think the year that it was done and for whom it was done, if it was a quilt done for a special person, uh, those are important things to have uh, on a quilt label. Um, maybe you don't think it's so important right now, but boy, down the road, it might be very important to your great-grandchild. Quilt labels can be low-tech or high-tech or a combination thereof. They can just be a Sharpie pen, a permanent marker on a piece of muslin stitched to the quilt. They can be made uh, with your computer uh, and printed onto paper with your printer. Or they can be made with your embroidery machine. And so whatever it is, we encourage quilt labels. Any others? Well, we're grateful for all of those that we mentioned who shared their memories and lent us their quilts for this program. We invite all of you to join us in the Gilmore Room to view most of the quilts that were featured in our program. Thank you.